All right, so welcome once again to Celebration Magazine Live's Live, Laugh, Zoom. We are on day two of this special event. We do have two more days to go. Um, tomorrow, we will have Al Fike with us doing some clean comedy and some music. And then we will also have on Friday, the Meadows Museum doing a very special presentation for us. So thank you so much for joining us. As always, I want to take a minute here, two minutes, uh, introduce our sponsor for today before we get into our official programming, and that is Twin River Senior Living. They have graciously donated to uh, the event today three $50 e-gift cards that we'll be giving away at the end of the event. And then he, us here at Celebration Magazine have thrown in a fourth $50 gift card. So make sure you stay all the way to the end because you must be present to win. Rebecca with Twin River Senior Living, tell us all about your amazing community. It is amazing and we've had so much fun in July. I don't know how we'll top it in August. We started the water aerobics and the outdoor yoga classes. We have volleyball parties. We're delivering donuts and cocktails and all kinds of fun stuff here. So uh, we think we'll even have more fun in August too. So uh, we are about to start a special promotion. Be watching the Celebration magazine because we're going to be starting a new promo with Refer a Friend. Get five hundred dollars. All you have to do is call me. Let me check the the You Got Lead system and see if they're already registered. If they're not and they move in after they move in, you get a five hundred dollar gift card. But watch for more information or call me if you have any questions. Uh, this is Rebecca at Twin River Senior Living. Donna, do you have anything you want to say? I think that was there. Maybe not. But we've been having such a great time. I'm so glad we're able to sponsor this event too. Our residents are having fun. We're staying safe also. And uh, everything's going well here. We had uh, eight move-ins this month and we're looking for more. So uh, just give us a call. Well, wonderful. Yeah, I don't know. We're having to don them, but we love her. We miss her. We send our love. We send her our love to you guys. Down. $500 is something pretty awesome, guys. So if, if you know anybody looking for a community, we will be sharing um, at the end of the event prior to the giveaways a graphic that will have the contact information for our friends over at Twin River Senior Living. Um, so be sure to check them out. Thank you very much, Rebecca. All right. So next up, we have our our speaker, our musician, our author, a Vietnam veteran, R.D. Foster, who started his career after the age of 70. Now, R.D. has written um, both nonfiction and fiction books, and those books are available, uh, If and his music, if you like what you hear today, um, they can be found on Amazon. Um, and if you're looking for his uh, nonfiction books, uh, those are under Ronnie D. Foster, okay? And you would look up R.D. Foster to find some of his music, and S.J. is going to be putting that information into the chat for everyone. If you would like to find it, we'll also include it in one of our newsletters coming out if you would like to find that later also. R.D., take it away. All right. Can you hear me all right? Mm-hmm. Okay, good deal. A little bit louder, R.D., just a little louder. All right, this is my first time to uh, do the Zoom, so I, I hope we get it all right. And uh, so anyway, thank you all for tuning in today, and thanks to Celebration Magazine for having me back again. And I want to thank the people down at the Collin County History Museum for all the work they do. And uh, But today I'm here at home near Anna, Texas, with my wife, Trina. <clears throat> two dogs and two cats. Now we've been self-quarantined for over four months now and we're doing just fine. And uh, I know it's a trying time in our country right now, but most of us on here, we remember back in the 60s, that was a pretty trying time also. But anyway, we all made it through and here we are. 
And so hopefully if we can forget all about that for about the next 45 minutes and just celebrate being alive. Now I'd like to, I'd like to start out playing a song I wrote a few years ago and it's all about living in this day-to-day -day world and you never know what's gonna happen next. And it's called The Dance of Life. Shake it to the left. Shake it to the right. First we're born, and then we die. In between, we do the dance of life. Shake it to the left. Shake it to the right. Oh, the dance of life. Keep you on your feet day and night, up into the beat. Shimmy, shimmy all over. Wave your arms and fly while the band keeps playing the dance of life. Shake it to the left. Shake it to the right. First we're born, and then we die. In between, we do the dance of love. Shake it to the left, shake it to the right. Sometimes it is, sometimes it ain't. Sometimes you can. Sometimes you can just keep on dancing one step at a time while the band keeps playing the dance of life. Shake it to the left, shake it to the right. First we're born and then we die. In between, we do the dance of life. Shake it to the left, shake it to the right. Shake it to the left, shake it to the right. Shake it. All right, if you're all clapping out there, thank you very much. <laughs> So I just want to say, I love to read and I've been an avid reader for all my life. And I started reading earlier in life and I give most of that credit to comic books. Now, according to most adults and all the teachers back then, uh, comic books and rock and roll music was going to rot your brain, make you start smoking cigarettes and uh, pretty soon you all become juvenile delinquents. Now I lived in a blue collar working class neighborhood just full of kids and while not in school, we spent our time on paper routes, uh, playing baseball, football, exploring their nearby woods and uh, going up and down the railroad track for miles and miles in both directions. And my favorite comic books are Archie and Jughead and Superman, Beetle Bailey, anything to do with uh, soldiers and combat and cowboy stories. And of course, everybody, every boy's favorite, Mad Magazine. With Alfred E. Newman and Mad Magazine, I discovered satire and out-of-the-box thinking, which would greatly influence my writing in later years. In the summertime, we'd sit under a shade tree and pass around the comic books that we had, and the same ones would be traded back and forth until they were per practically worn out. And it was a big event when one of the boys showed up with a new one. The older boys, they would sit around under a shade tree and they'd read allowed for the kids that couldn't read yet. And that was my introduction to the literary world and to reading in general. Now the thing about comic books is that they're really simple, easy to read and with drawings that mainly tell the story. Now I had a pretty good imagination as a kid and I thought, you know, if I could draw pretty well, I could write my own comic book. And uh, when I got into fourth grade, I met a kid, he could draw, draw pretty good. So we got together and we actually 
did some comic strips. We thought they were pretty, pretty good, but our teacher, Mrs. Wilson, she said the Army ones were too violent. And we said, well, heck, that's our best ones. And so that's about as far as that went. In the first grade, we started reading with Tip and Mitten and Dick and Jane, and I'm sure many of y'all started with those same books. As I progressed through elementary school, I discovered stuff like the Hardy Boys and Robinson Crusoe and Marco Polo. In junior high and high school, it was Guadalcanal Diary, Battle Cry, the Green Berets. In high school, I was sports editor of the school paper, and enjoyed writing, was pretty good at it, and thought that someday I hoped to be a writer also. And about that same time, I started playing guitar. And when I got to write to where I could play very well, I found I really wasn't into playing all the old standards and the current hits on the radio. And, and some of those biggest, biggest hits were songs with just simple lyrics. And I got to thinking, well, if I could come up with some original tunes, I think I could write songs. I mean, if you look at songs like Blue Suede Shoes, Peggy Sue, anything by Hank Williams, there's nothing fancy there. Just everyday words spoken by everyday people. And they're all great songs and they're all still around today. Now, it took me a few years to get that down, but eventually I started writing songs that other artists were playing. But back in the good old days of Top 40 Radio and American Bandstand, a good song had to have four things. A tune with a simple melody, memorable, catchy lyrics. It's a tune you could easily whistle or hum, a good beat, but most important, was easy to dance to. So I thought, you know, if I can do all that in two, two and a half minutes, well then with two or 300 words to work with, two or 300 pages to work with, I thought, you know, I think I could really write a book too. So one of the first pieces of advice for a new writer is write what you know. Well, at 17, I thought I knew it all, but I really didn't know much about anything. And my favorite books had always had to do with some sort of adventure, and that's the kind of books I wanted to write. And that was one of the reasons I chose to enlist in the United States Marine Corps. It was the end of my senior year in 1966. The conflict in Vietnam was becoming a full-scale war and there was about a 99% chance that a Marine would end up in a combat zone. Now, I didn't have a death wish, as some of my high school friends suggested. and They also said I was crazy, which I had no defense for. And, but I, I just wanted to do more than read about what Marines do. I wanted to see it for myself. So on June the 19th, 1966, Two weeks after we had received that hard-earned high school diploma, my good friend Bill Bryan and I climbed aboard a train in downtown Dallas. Our destination was United States Marine Recruit Depot, San Diego, California. Now, we couldn't believe it. We were finally off to the world. Now, neither of us had ever been anywhere before, and now at 18, we're about to embark on an adventure that most people just read about or see in a movie. Most of my three years as an enlisted Marine were served overseas, and I was fortunate enough to spend time in Okinawa, the Philippine Islands, Singapore, and Vietnam, which was quite an experience for a small town boy who had never been more than a couple of hundred miles away before. Well, I made it back all safe and sound, but my high school buddy and my brother Marine, Bill, didn't, Bill Bryan, didn't make it home. He was killed in the Battle of Quezon in 1968. And, uh, there's my buddy, Bill Brown, right here. So hope y'all can see that. As a leader of a seven-man reconnaissance team on a mountain deep in the jungle, Bill died attempting to save the lives of two critically wounded team members. His heroic action would, learn, would earn him the Navy Cross, which is second only to the Medal of Honor for his heroism that day. After all these years, I still think about Bill quite often, and the last time I saw him. And after grad, we graduated from boot camp, we were sent our separate ways and according to what we were being trained for. It was on a Sunday afternoon, I was at Camp Onifray Beach Club on the base at Camp Pendleton, California. Now we weren't high school boys anymore, we were United States Marines. We were just like John Wayne, well in the movies anyway. Well, Bill just happened to be there that day also and we decided that since we were men now, 
we'd go to the bar and buy each other a beer. Well, the only problem was we weren't old enough to buy a beer. So we settled for a chocolate milkshake instead. And that would be the last time I would see my friend Bill Bryan ever again. Now, during those three years that I served, I'd seen and done so many interesting things and exciting things, unbelievable things that only the guys that shared those experiences would understand and believe. I certainly, I certainly had plenty of exciting, adventurous things to write about now. The only problem was back at home, nobody wanted to hear anything about Vietnam, as I quickly found out. I was anxious to tell all my old friends about the things I'd done and seen, but they really didn't want to hear, it, hear about it. And all those conversations, they quickly changed to something about girls or the Dallas Cowboys or something about that. I started to college and in my creative writing course, I wrote a short story about a Marine in Vietnam. When the papers come back, I'd been given an A plus with a note from the teacher that said she'd like to see me after the class. And so I was thinking, wow, she really must have liked that. And you know, I was thinking this could be the start of my, my long awaited writing career. I really liked your story, she said. Your descriptions are vivid. Your characters are all believable and interesting. However, if I were you, I would change the setting to maybe World War II or the Civil War. Nobody wants to read about Vietnam. Well, that kind of popped my balloon, which I wasn't expecting that. And with the, the anti-establishment culture going strong in college at the time, I'd kept low key and nobody knew I'd been in the military, much less in Vietnam. And now everyone in the class knew and a damn Marine at that. I instantly became some sort of pariah and was snubbed for the rest of the semester. Now I really took it hard that the great heroes like Bill Bryan were considered the bad guys by these ungrateful, selfish people. And the way Vietnam veterans were treated back then is pretty much like the, our police officers are being treated today. And I really hate to see that. A lot of my friends and relatives are police officers and, and they're nothing like what they portray on the news. Well, I dropped out of college and I took a job as a long haul truck driver, but I didn't quit riding. All alone in a big 18 wheeler driving cross country for hours and days and weeks at a time, you had nothing to do but think. The bad part about that was there was a whole lot of not too pleasant stuff that was going on in my brain that I really didn't want to think about. So I kept on writing. I would create entire songs in my head and at some point, pull into a truck stop, get my guitar out of the sleeper and record a song on a little cassette recorder. In a couple of years, I had enough songs to form a band and start playing parties and honky tonks around Dallas and Fort Worth. Most of my songs went over pretty well, except I soon realized, well, maybe that teacher was right because nobody wanted to hear the songs about Vietnam. So in 2003, 35 years after my war had ended, I ran across a guy I hadn't seen since high school and we started talking and he said, if I remember correctly, you and Bill Bryan joined the Marines right out of high school. I told him that we did. Well, whatever happened to Bill, he asked. I said, well, Bill was killed in Vietnam. Oh yeah, he said, I forgot. Well, at that point, I determined that even though for those 35 years, I tried not to think all that much about Vietnam, but it was time to bring it all back and honor Bill Bryan and the guys like him in books and songs. Now this is a song I wrote about that. James Malone was also a high school friend of mine and he was killed in Vietnam as well. And this song is called Guys Like James Malone.
they called his name in 66, shipped out overseas. There he died a hero, that's what the medal's for, rest in stone, James Malone, back home from the world. Well, I wonder who remember the names on the wall when all the friends are dead and gone. Well, anyone else don't let their memories fade away, their spirits dead and gone. Don't let them be forgotten. Guys like James Moore. James never went to college, he never got to vote, he never raised a family, he never owned a boat. Guys like me who made it home and go again at night, when we're gone we'll carry on please, don't let our heroes well, I wonder who remembers the names of the one when all the friends are dead and gone. Well, anyone at all, don't let their memories fade away, their spirits dead and gone. Don't let them be forgotten. Guys like James Bond. Sure, a whole lot of y'all people they don't, they don't know guys just like James Malone. Now, all the stories I'd written about, all the songs I'd written about Vietnam were songs that told a story. So I started taking those songs and creating fictional accounts of the story behind each one. And by the time I was finished, I had my first book finished. And it was called Last Train Running. And that's Last Train Running right there. And the book is a continuation of that story that I wrote in college. I wanted to be a writer since I was a kid and finally at the age of 55, it became a reality. And I thought, well, to hell with the experts and all those college kids that don't want to read about, about Vietnam. That part of our history to me is just as important as World War II or the Civil War. And even though the book is fiction, it comes from true events experienced by me my friends or stories I'd heard from guys who were there. Now, Last Train Running is a story of a young singer-songwriter from Dallas, Texas, who was being tatted as the next big thing in folk music. But he fell in love with the wrong girl and ends up as, in Vietnam as a corpsman with the Marine Rifle Company. Even though his music career in the past, he still writes songs about his daily existence in a combat zone. For me, this is an example of write what you know. Now, I've spent over 30 years in the music business and I was a Marine in Vietnam and I know what it's like to lose your girlfriend so far away and feeling helpless is what you can do about it. So those stories came rather easy to me. And the last train running is much more than just a war story. It's actually a love story about two young men in love with the same girl. One half of the story takes place in Vietnam, the other half starts in Austin, Texas and covers a lot of ground. Now, Everett, Everett Blaylock, our main character, who grew up in Buckner's Orphan's home in Dallas. After, student, after high school, he became a student at North Texas State College in Denton. And there he became a professional singer-songwriter with a three, 
Peace Folk group called Last Train Running. Now the group took off like a skyrocket and were pretty soon opening shows for people like Bob Dylan, the Kingston Trio, Peter, Paul, and Mary. While playing a gig in New Orleans, he couldn't keep his eyes off this beautiful girl in the front row wearing a silver miniskirt and a wonderful smile. And she couldn't keep her eyes off of him. It would turn out to be a case of love at first sight. However, Holly was a wealthy debutante from North Dallas and Everett was a struggling student and musician and that didn't go over very well with her parents. And by the mid 60s, folk music, once extremely popular on college campuses had pretty much lost its luster. With the under introduction of British bands like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Animals, rock and roll would rule the airwaves and the record stores for years to come. So by the mid 1960s, last train running gigs were getting few and far between. Now by the time his college graduation came around, Everett and Holly were sharing an apartment in Denton, much to the chagrin of her politically well-connected parents. They weren't about to let their daughter marry some long-haired orphan hippie who played the guitar. She was better, she was destined for better things than that. So with a little whisper and a nudge to the right people, Everett found his draft notice in the mailbox the day after graduation. Now, being a guy who wrote songs about peace and love, he was scared to death that he would end up in the U.S. Army as a rifleman in order to go pe kill people in Vietnam or be killed himself. And so there he had a brilliant idea. Since he had a college degree now, he went and visited the Navy recruiter to explore his options. And after careful consideration, he thought the medical field would be the best. The recruiter told him that he would probably spend his entire enlistment working as an x-ray technician or something like that in a big, nice Navy hospital in some exotic place like Hawaii, Japan, Europe, California. And that sounded just great to Everett. And he thought with duty like that, he could still have time to write, play, and sing. And he wouldn't have to kill anyone. You know, but re recruiters can be pretty persuasive and they have been known to exaggerate, you know, a little bit anyway. Now, for those of us who have been in the service, we know that the military often works in mysterious ways. After eight months of medical training, Everett found himself landing at the Da Nang Air Base on his way to a Marine Rifle Company as his combat corpsman. Turned out to be his worst nightmare. At the time, the Navy needed more men in the, in the field than it did X-ray technicians in big, nice hospitals, and the Marine Corps really needed combat corpsmen. Meanwhile, back in the States, Holly would, had learned that she was pregnant and was strictly forbidden by her family of having a baby out of wedlock, especially a baby born to that no good musician she had hooked up with. And after a little reluctance, a lot of pressure, Holly agreed. She stopped writing Everett, who had just arrived in Vietnam, and moved to Austin, where she could have the baby in secret, put it up for adoption, and no one would ever know she had a baby. Now while there, she met David Duncan Westerfield, who was a student at the University of Texas, a journalism major, and also the son of wealthy parents. Now David was part of the anti-war crowd in Austin and worked at an Austin weekly newspaper. However, his political views collided with the newspaper's political stance and in retaliation, he was assigned to what he called a puff piece about a pop star that seemed to have just fallen off the face of the earth. The assignment, whatever happened to the folk group, last train running. The band was reaching the top of the genre and just disappeared. Well, little did David know that that little puff piece would take him halfway around the globe and then to a world he never existed, knew existed and would change his life forever. Meeting Holly at their family lake house on Lake Travis, David, like Everett, had fell in love with her at first sight. Now the story will take you to a whirlwind romance and a long incredible journey that takes you across Texas, inside a Mexican prison, San Francisco, Singapore, Washington DC, and Vietnam in search of last train running. So anyway, if you'd like to read a good adventure story and weaved in a good love story, I think you'd like this book. Now in the story of Everett Blaylock, with every combat mission, he takes his guitar, sits in a cool bunker, or under a shade tree and write songs about his latest experiences. And this is one of those songs, it's called Somebody Stop the World. Welcome to the 
jungle. It's a rumble, pick a hip boy, and rock and roll. Life ain't like you know it, but you owe it to yourself, save yourself. Somebody stop the world and let me on. Somebody stop the world. Out for the reaper, he's a creeper, lock and load, fight for your life. There's rain and fire falling in this muddy, bloody hill, you don't Somebody stop the world and let me on. Somebody stop the world, and uh, and that's on our CD, the Red River Surfers, and uh, John Harden, who's sitting out there somewhere, he's playing spoons on that album, by the way. So, so anyway, I'll tell you about my my next book, my my third book, and second novel. It was twenty something years in the making, and it's called The Honky Tonk Life, or Put a Flashing Neon Light on My Tombstone. And there's that book right there. And that title came from two songs that I had written. And uh, anyway, we're having a thunderstorm here. So if you hear some thunder, well, that, that's us. <laughs> and this again, this book again came under the advice, write what you know. Now, when I was on the road in the music business, I would be gone for as much as three months at a time. And in those times, as many shows as possible were, were plugged in. For the booking agents, it was all about the money, and to them, it was get it while you can. So for most bands on the road, you're always in one of three places. You're on the bus, at the gig, or in a hotel room. In the early 1980s, I was playing a lot of honky-tonks in bars, but not making very much money. And a good friend of mine by the name of Ray Wiley Hubbard, he was riding high on a song he wrote called Redneck Mother. It was recorded by Jerry Jeff Walker. Now that song became a nationwide hit and Ray Wiley was booking nationwide gigs. At that point, he bought a bus for his band to travel in. And when the next tour came around, he didn't have a driver yet. And he asked me that if, if I would drive until he found one. Well, I'd gone to truck driving school in the Marine Corps and I had thousands of miles behind the wheel of an 18 wheeler. So I had all the qualifications. Soon after that, word got around that I was a pretty good dependable driver and could go long distances at a time, which the musicians liked. That meant spending less time on the bus. So I started receiving calls from major acts to drive on their next tour. Well, the position of bus driver played a heck of a lot more money than playing in those honky tonks I was working in. So I spent my next few years uh, on the road with major concert tours. And during that time, I spent many, many hours in hotel rooms. And I was never one to sit around doing nothing or watching TV. So I bought some notebooks and pencils and papers and, and I've spent all my time in those hotel rooms writing. 
And 25 years later, I published The Honky Tonk Life or Put a Flashing Neon Light on My Tombstone, which was all originally written by hand in a whole big stack of notebooks. As with Last Train Running, this is a story of a young songwriter from North Texas that spans a time from the early 1960s up to the 90s. Now, most of those stories in the book, they come from songs I'd already written. And I was able to expand on the lyrics and creative tale of what it was like traveling in a bus on the road across America. And in this book is where some of my out of the box thinking wandered in that I'd learned from Mad Magazine back in the 1950s. The Honky Tonk Life is a story of a little country band that almost hit the big time, but a tragic bush crash ended that dream. This is a love story, also a story about a young man searching for his long lost mom and dad. The adventure begins in California in the early 90s, goes back in time to Texas of the 1960s and ends up back in the 90s. And it goes from the deep woods of Red River County, Texas, to the Big D Jamboree in Dallas, to Nashville, New York City, all across the country to California. It's a saga of mystery, magic, friendship, deceit, love, death, but mostly it's all about show business. This book was so much fun to write that I still read it again every once in a while. As in Last Train Running, it's a work of fiction, but many of the stories are actual events and people that I've worked with through the years, although now they have different names to my fictional characters. So if you want to read about a band being on the road in America and, and honky tonk music and what it's like doing all that, I'm sure you'd like the honky tonk life or put a flashing neon light on my tombstone. And this next song uh -huh. is called put a flashing neon light on my tombstone. And I wrote it well before I wrote the book. So. Little honky talk When my days have come and gone And I've sang my last song And the graveyard's my next place of rest Give that old hearse to home When we pass that honky talk And please just grant me one request Put a flash in the night on my tombstone. Well, I can't bear the thought of flying there all alone. Put a flash in the night on my tombstone. And when you leave, please leave the jukebox alone. Well, I've had my ups and downs, had my fun and run around. And ladies, I've loved quite a few. But when the good times are all gone, and I'm out there all alone, when the sun goes down, what am I gonna do? Put a flashing neon light on my tombstone. Well, I can't bear the thought of lying there all alone. Put a flashing neon light on my tombstone And when you go, please take the jukebox on When they put me in the ground Will my friends still come around? Or will they think that I'll be alright? Well, I won't mind those sunny days As the years just slip away but I know I'll never make it through the night. Put a flash in me, I light on my tombstone. Well, I can't bear the thought of lying there all alone. Put a flash in me, I light on my tombstone. And when you go, please do the jukebox on. Yeah, when you go, just leave the jukebox on. Oh, put a flashing neon light on my tombstone. All right. I don't think they allow that in the cemeteries, but anyway, it's a good thought. Now in the book, there's a band called the Red River Surfers. 
And for the last few years, I've been playing and recording with my band, which I call the Red River Surfers. You can see our logo. I don't know if you see that or not. But uh, so I just want to, now we have a CD out. It's on Amazon and also on YouTube. So if you'd like to hear some of these songs that, from these books, they're on that, that CD. And uh, like I said, John Harden, a spoon master, he's, he's on all those songs. And uh, once again, I just want to thank you all for tuning in today and, and closing. I'd just like to say I'm proud to have fought for my country under the good old stars and stripes. And today, our flag is under attack like never before. And this is a song I wrote about that. It's called Take a Stand. <laughs> Here's to the colors, red, white, and blue. I'll stand beside you and what we have to do. There comes a time when you got to take a stand. The price of freedom is blood on the sand. It ain't free. Being free, it don't come free. To fight for your right to be free. It ain't free, it don't come free. Here's to the soldiers, God bless you. You got the courage to do what you do. There comes a time when you got to take a stand. The price of freedom is blood on the sand. It ain't free. Being free, it don't come free. You got to fight for your right to be free. It ain't free. Black protesters, God bless you too. You've got the freedom to do what you do. Just remember your right to take a stand. It was paid for with blood on the sand. It ain't free. Being free, it don't come free. You've got to fight for free. It ain't free. It don't come free. You've got to fight for your right to be free. It ain't free. Oh, it don't come free. So thank you again. God bless America. Semper Fi and here's back to Zoe. Ah, R.D., thank you so much. And first, I want to say thank you so much for your service. We appreciate uh, everything that you've done. Everyone is off mute now. Let's give R.D. a yeah. hand and a cheer. Thank you for your service. We've received so many great compliments today about your music and about yeah. your stories and everyone really enjoys you joining us. So thank you so much for coming in. Let's give them a last whoop whoop. Hey, 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 hey. All right, RD, thank you so much for joining us, everybody.